Hello and welcome to Tia's Stories of Life. Today we are going to talk about the disappearance of 10-year-old Briasia Terrell and the trial of her brother's dad, Henry Deacons Jr. So just to give a little recap on the case for people who are not too familiar with the case. On July 10th, 2020, officers were sent to 2744 East 53rd Street, Apartment 8, to investigate Briasia's disappearance. Now, just to back up a little bit, Briasia and her half-brother were sent to, he's younger than her, I can't remember how many years, but Briasia and her half-brother went to Briasia's half-brother's dad house, who is Henry Deacons Jr., to spend the night, and Deacons lived with a girlfriend there, and so during that overnight visit, Briasia vanished, and so now here we have on July 10th, 2020, Deacons has called the officers and the officers that came out to speak to Deacons. And he told police that Briasia was missing and that when he woke up that she was gone, but she had never ran away before. Now Deacons girlfriend, Andrea Corberson, told police she fell asleep at 11 p.m. or midnight, July 9th. She said when she went to sleep, Deacons was on the couch in the living room and Briasia and her half-brother were asleep in the bedroom. Investigators questioned Deacons and the girlfriend, Andrea, and um, one thing about the police, they responded to this case quickly and were, I'm sure they honed in on Deacons very quickly, especially given Deacons' background, which we'll get into a little later. Now, there were warrants put out on Deacon's cell phone. There was a warrant put out on a motorhome that he owned. And also DNA swabs from his mouth and underneath his fingernails. And pictures of his body was um, also signed with a warrant by a judge. And so they did all of that this tells me that they were honing in on him probably from the beginning. Andrea Culberson told police she woke up again about 3 a.m. July 10th and discovered Briasia and Deacons gone. She attempted to call Deacons, but he had left his cell phone at the apartment. And then just to stop right there, if he left his cell phone at the apartment, didn't she hear the ring? Unless he turned the ringer off. So I'll give her that and say maybe the ringer was off. But anyway, at 7.17 a.m., Andrea texts Deacons asking where he was. She said he returned home after that text. Now, the Deacons came home, he picked up his cell phone and then left again saying he was going to look for Briasia. Now, according to the search warrant, Deacons' phone records show Andrea attempted to call Deacons at 3.11 a.m., and 3.12 a.m. Phone records indicate Deacon's phone was off when the calls were made. Okay, so that's all right. Unless he turned it off when he left the house. On uh, July 14th, Andrea came to the detectives again, and she said she had put Deacon's phone on a phone charger at 3 a.m. Now, she said she was calling him, so, okay, this follow-up visit to the police, she coming correct and telling the truth because there was things that she lied to them about during the initial uh, questioning. So, anyway, she said she put his phone charger on at 3 a.m. and something she said something she had not told police before, which, you know, I just said. So, anyway... She denied trying to call Deacons, even though Verizon phone records show she called him at approximately 311 and 312. And that could have been orchestrated because she could have been told to do that to make it look like, I don't know, to make it look like they were trying to look for Asia. So she also disclosed that she had seen Deacons after 3 a.m. on July 10th before he left again. And she said that she saw a girl she believed to be Briasia standing outside by Deacon's Red Impala. So again, 
she saw this, but she didn't say anything. And she didn't tell police this in initial questioning. So, let's get into Deacon's past. Deacon has a long criminal history that started decades ago. He was convicted of third-degree sexual assault August 23rd of 1990, which was his first offense. He was 17 at the time of the crime and was found guilty of assaulting a girl 13 years old or younger. Now, Deacons is considered a Tier 3 offender, the most severe of the three Iowa sex offense tiers. It means that the offender committed violence or threatened violence during the assault, which makes Deacons a very dangerous person, especially around young girls, which again, it makes me wonder why did the mother send her daughter to his home? And did she know about his past? So before I get into my commentary, I have some clips I want to show you regarding um, the recent trial, Henry Deacons Jr. And then I'll come back for commentary. During the early morning hours, cameras at nearby businesses caught a dark sedan. At 2.29 a.m., headlights are captured, leaving a lot off Schmidt Road. That's the same lot where Dinkins RV was parked. From 2.51 a.m. to 2.53 a.m., we see a sedan entering Credit Island and then leave. That same day, Detective Orbit dis discovers a flip-flop at Credit Island. His body camera shows Briage's mother look at photos of the shoe. No way. No, just, I know. At the house, the shoe. Not, no, that's not her it's shoe. shoe. Briage Terrell's remains. In your examination of the skeletal remains, um, did you note any trauma? I did. Forensic anthropologist or bone specialist, Dr. Heather Garvin takes the stand, identifying two bullet impacts on Briage's right shoulder, another in her lower jaw. He just said he was like a father to her. Former Clinton County jail inmates Matt Dean and David Baker take the stand, sharing a comment Dinkins made while watching TV in February of 2021. The news story came on and, and broadcasted that they were continually looking for her and he would state that they were never going to find her. Dinkins uh, <clears throat> said to me uh, they would never find her. But on March 22nd, 2021, three fishermen did find those remains at a pond near the Kunau implement. The first fisherman at the scene testifying he saw something very white out of the corner of his eye. Turns out it was, it was their skull. Um, what did you observe when you got to that location? Uh, human remains. What did you do when you saw that skull? Picked it up. And why did you do that? It's just not something that you see every day. So I picked it up and kind of just sat where I was and looked around, and that's when we found the other remains. The three calling the non-emergency line, unknowingly discovering 10-year-old Briasia Terrell. This Terrell's is security remains. footage of Henry Dinkins entering a quick stop on 53rd Street at 3.30 a.m. the night Briasia Terrell went missing. Footage Dinkins was unaware law enforcement had at the time of his initial interview. After failing to retrieve basic information, the interviewing officer, Evan Obert, begins pushing Dinkins. Would you be fine if we downloaded the phone to have the call logs and the text? For what reason? What's the passcode to the phone? Just give me my phone and I'll, and I'll open it up for you. Okay. Will you open up right in front of me? Right, yeah, open it up right here. Cool. The officer leaves a map on the table before exiting the room, asking Dinkins to circle where he searched for Briasia. Dinkins simply stares. Think of any or mark any? No, no I ain't marked none, but I'll just look. You saw. Why are you looking at me? Do my past? Well, that's 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 what I, I asked. No, I, I, I said I will open it for you. Yeah, but I, 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 but I don't understand how I got suspicious with my own kids, man. These are my kids. No, you know what I'm saying? Know. I mean, I... Dinkins describes walking back in after that quick shop trip, discovering Briasia was missing. And then. When I came back, I grabbed Dink. D is Briasia's brother and Dinkins' biological son. You know, and I'm like, man, he like, Dad, where, where is Bri? I said, uh, I'm not, I don't know. He's like, and then we look, we roll around. And Dinkins saying he and his son went searching for Briasia, but fails to mention one important stop. A stop at a Clinton Walmart, where Dinkins enters the store at 7.05 a.m. 
grabs a cart and heads to the cleaning supply section, placing two bottles of Clorox bleach in his cart. Oh my God, this is getting me. In the store, his son testified that he put the battery back into Dinkins' cell phone to play games because the battery was not in his phone. When Dinkins returned to the car, he says they went on a long car ride down a dirt road. And that's when he says he watched his father get out of the car and pour the bleach by some bushes. After that, he says his father drove him to his RV. What did the two of you do when you got to the RV? He opened the trunk of the purple Imp Impala and he grabbed out a bloody knife. So he opened a, he said bloody knife? A bloody knife, yeah. From the trunk of his Impala? Yes. And it's your testimony. He went on to say that his father wiped the knife off with bleach and then put it in his RV. During cross-examination, he testified Brasia was with him and his dad the morning that she disappeared, a timeline the defense questioned several times, including questioning his memory. He later claimed that he was there and watched his father shoot Brasia. Listen in. Either you were there when she was killed or you weren't. I said, I guess. I don't accept that answer, sir. Either you were there when she was shot or you weren't. I was there. Damn. So you were there? Yes. You saw your dad sh shoot Breja Terrell? Time? Yes. Yes, I did. And then what time did you clock in after your lunch break? Um, I clocked back in at 1.33 p.m. And then what time did you clock out on July 9th of 2020? I clocked out at 5.07. Okay. And then so from that, did your trip over to the apartment complex um, occur within, you know what, an hour or so later? Yes. Okay. okay. Now, on July 10th, um, what does it show as a time that you actually clocked in at? It says that I clocked in at 8.04 a.m. What time did you clock out? I clocked out at 8.16 a.m. Okay. I want to pick up at the point in time where um, you described sitting in the back room and you were crying. Yes. There at Checkers. Um, what did your manager encourage you to do? He encouraged me to get into the car and, and go downtown and figure out what was going on. By going downtown, what do you mean? Like going down to the police department. Did you actually leave Checkers to travel down to the Davenport Police Department? I did. All right. When you left Checkers, what direction did you head to go downtown to the Davenport Police Department? I was heading west, so I was heading away from, so yeah, I think it was west, right? On what street? On Locust. As you were traveling west on Locust, did you notice something of interest to you? Yes, I did. Describe. Um, I noticed uh, Mr. Dinkins and Paula flying down the opposite way, um, making a really hard turn on, I think it's a left turn on Eastern. Okay. What type of vehicle was he driving? He was driving in a maroon Impala with tinted windows. Okay. Um, and then did you pass him when you saw him heading east? Yes, and... What did you do? I made a U-turn. And then at that point in time, describe what you did. I was speeding behind him, honking the horn. Um, I was calling his phone. Um, and when I finally got him on the phone, he said that he was headed to Jersey Meadows um, because they wanted to talk to him out there. And I was still on this bumper, honking the horn, and we had pulled over by the McDonald's on, on Northwest, or it's like Kimberly, East Kimberly, across the street from Walgreens by the old Kaplan. All right. How would you describe the rate of speed that Mr. Dinkins was traveling? Well... I was probably going about 65, 70 possibly. Uh, good driving. evening. As you mentioned, that timeline shown in court today. I'm going to break it all down for you right now. So that timeline starts just before midnight when Andrea Culberson says she fell asleep. Now at 2.13 a.m., we see a dark colored sedan traveling near the RV that Dinkins owned. Then at 2.29 a.m., we see the sedan leave that RV. Detective Obert says that while they can't say for sure that it's 
the Impala Dinkins drove. It says it looks very similar to that one. Now at 3 a.m., Andrea says she woke up to find Briasia and Dinkins gone from the apartment. Then at 3.30 a.m., Andrea says Dinkins returned to the apartment, grabbed something from his closet and left. Now of note, this is the same time she saw Briasia standing next to the Impala. Between 3.33 and 3.38 a.m., we see Dinkins at the quick shop buying gas. Then we see what appears to be a dark colored sedan traveling north on Highway 61 around 3.44 a.m. And this is where the timeline uh, skips ahead. Again, though, of note, we know that Brazia's remains were found near the Kunau implements up uh, near DeWitt. Now at 5.55 a.m., Dinkins picks up D.L. from the apartment complex. Between 6.58 and 7.10 a.m., we know Dinkins is at the Clinton Walmart buying bleach. We then know Dinkins traveled back to Davenport where he is picked up, driving onto Credit Island and leaving again between 8.18 a.m. and 8.22 a.m. We then see Dinkins and D.L. outside of the RV at 8.24 a.m. At 8.55 a.m., Dinkins is back at the apartment complex with Officer Burkle, DL, and Aisha Langford, Breja's mother, before he leaves. At 11.46 a.m., he is seen on video near his mom and his sister's apartment. And then at noon, Dinkins arrives at the police department. Now, at the memorial that Breja Terrell's family has made for her, and right down this road is the pond where police found Breja Terrell's body nine months after she went missing. But after that judge delivered the guilty verdict this afternoon, Brasia's loved ones came back to her memorial. They added some of these balloons as well to so some more flowers. They certainly were somber, but I also could sense a large feeling of relief. More than three years since Brasia Terrell went missing, justice in a legal sense was served. Brasia's mom, Aisha Lankford, saying how she feels that she can finally breathe again. But even though a guilty verdict was delivered, Aisha says it will never be enough. There is no amount of justice to do that can compare to what he took from me. He took everything from me. He took away a lot from me. He took a, a lot from me. He broke me down. And he took I was looking through um, videos and articles about this case. I was trying to find anything that will even kind of answer why, you know, the motive of the case, like the motive. Did Deacons disclose that? Why would he kill this 10 year old girl, a baby? Why? Was it a fact that he had sexually assaulted her and he didn't want her to speak about it because he didn't want to go back to prison? It makes me think that because I can't think of any other reason why he would commit such a heinous crime. And why would you do that in front of your son? So you've taken the life of this baby before it even began and then you're going to traumatize your young son and this could be trauma that lasts for a lifetime which I pray it doesn't but I mean like why would you do that I, I just don't understand it and so anyway deacons haven't said anything he hasn't disclosed the motive about why he committed such a heinous crime he did write a letter to the judge, and um, I have included that um, a link to the article in the um, description box, so you can read that in your leisure, because he has all kind of court um, cases attached to it, and like he's some amateur detective or um, paralegal, but I, I've, I didn't want to read through it, so you can read that at your leisure.